I'm Randall Pinkston at Carnegie Council. Welcome to Ethics Matter. For the first time, we're pleased to present Dr. Kumi Naidu, a person with decades of dedication and experience as an activist for human rights and environmental justice. He's a director of Africa Rising, a former honorary president of Civicus, and the past president and first person from the South to lead Greenpeace. His earliest activism in his homeland inspired by Stephen Biko and Nelson Mandela, among others, was against the fight against apartheid. Uh, he worked to build South Africa's electoral machinery, worked with non-government organizations, served as Secretary General of the Global Call to Action Against Poverty, and along the way he became a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford and earned a doctorate in political sociology. Dr. Naidu, you have dedicated your life to a long list of causes and the need for civic engagement and collaboration, but in recent years you've been focusing on climate change. Now, why do you describe that as the most important human rights issue? Well, you know, the head of the global trade union movement, Sharon Burroughs, says we as trade unionists have to fight climate change because there are no jobs on a dead planet. So if there are no jobs on a dead planet, there are no human rights on a dead planet because there's no human beings on a dead planet. So the climate change reality, I always say, is one that people need to become about at one level, tongue in cheek, because it's not about saving the planet. The planet does not need saving uh, because if we continue on the suicidal trajectory that we are with our dependency on oil, coal and gas, for example, which drives uh, climate catastrophe, the end result will be we will be gone as a species, the planet will still be here. And the truth is, once human beings become extinct, then the forests will recover, the oceans will replenish, and so on. So let's be very clear. The struggle to avert catastrophic climate change is fundamentally about whether humanity can fashion a way to coexist in a mutually interdependent relationship with nature for centuries and centuries to come. Put differently, the struggle to avert catastrophic climate change is fundamentally about protecting our children, and their children and their children's futures. And in that sense, it's a fundamentally a human rights issue for me. I, I have maintained since day one that the struggle to avert catastrophic climate change and the struggle to address human rights, poverty, economic justice, and so on, must, can, and should be seen as two sides of the same coin. So is it fair to say that you were led to this position because of your activism in the anti-apartheid movement, or did it come much later? Was it an evolutionary <laughs> um, discovery for you? That, that's a very good question, actually, because growing up as a young activist in South Africa, the image that most of us had about environmental activism was it was what rich people and white people did, mm -hmm. right? And the truth is many white people in South Africa treated the animals and pets and so on much better than they treated the majority of our people. So, so one had, growing up, a somewhat negative uh, sort of disposition towards environmental activism. But the two things had a major impact. As an anti-poverty activist, I was seeing so many good efforts to address poverty being rolled back by climate impacts. So if you look at the coastline of Bangladesh, for example, where over the decades many good investments were made in trying to lift people out of poverty. Today we're seeing sea level rise already beginning to push people inland because people cannot grow uh, food as they used to do in the past. So that was one factor. The other factor, I must be honest, and some people in my, uh, my colleagues at Greenpeace were not entirely happy for me giving this reason. If, when people ask me, why did you join Greenpeace in the environmental struggle? I said, actually, my daughter told me to. Mm. Because uh, <coughs> Greenpeace approached me when I was in the middle of a hunger strike trying to put pressure on my government in South Africa not to continue to support the Robert Mugabe regime in Zimbabwe when uh, human rights violations were just kind of mounting up. And, and, and so I was on 19 days on water only when uh, I get a call from Greenpeace asking me without consider becoming 
a candidate for the position and I said thanks very much but you know I'm not in a position <laughs> to make such a decision given the fact that I've been already 19 days on hunger strike. That same day my daughter called me and having seen me on television having lost a lot of weight she was about 16 and a half then and she said dad why are you still doing interviews and so on so I said no the only people I spoke to today is you and these folks from uh, uh, Greenpeace and when she said, so what did you tell them? I said, I told them that I was very grateful, but the timing was a bit bad. And then she said to me, Dad, I won't talk to you if you don't seriously consider this job. Your daughter told you My this. daughter. Because for somebody who considers oneself educated like you do, it's pathetic how little you understand about how, in fact, my generation's future is so threatened by the realities of climate change. This is your 16-year-old daughter. daughter. Yeah. Where did she get her knowledge and concern about Well, the she's been exposed to quite a lot of activism and so on. And it's not as if I was not engaged around ah. environmental stuff. Yeah. But I was like treating climate change like as any other issue. But climate change is not any other issue. Because let's say with gender equality, it's pathetic that after so many decades of activism, by the women's movement and so on, we still have so much of gender inequality in the world. However, with gender inequality, we still have time, you know, we can continue to struggle and we can win over time. But with climate, we have a clock that's ticking, right? We are five minutes to midnight in terms of that moment when we have catastrophic runaway climate change, when it'll be irreversible. How do you get a critical mass of people as energized and as passionate about this concern that you've just spelled out, which obviously has a bearing on human survival. The short answer is with extreme difficulty, <laughs> right? And the reason for that is, you know, let's say with a human rights violation, if I get arrested and tortured and the scars from my torture, I come out of prison, the media can come there, take a photograph, you can see the scar, everybody knows the injustice has happened. With poverty, if somebody's homeless or somebody's starving, you can take a photograph, you can see, okay, the person is homeless, the person is starving, and people can understand that there's something wrong here that we need to address. The challenge with climate change is that the detractors will always say, ah, but, you know, with, let's say, Hurricane Sandy, they'll say, ah, but we always have hurricanes, right? So negating the fact that the intensity, the height of the waves, the velocity and ferociousness of how it hit was out of this. However, I think the way we move forward is we start allowing young people to lead. Hmm. I believe that the current generation of adult leaders in all sectors of society have run out of fresh ideas. They keep trotting out stale, solutions that have not worked in the past and we need to create the space and, and we need to go against the idea that says oh young people are the leaders of tomorrow you know which adults love to say in very real ways today young people are the leaders today when I look throughout the world where I've had a, the honor and privilege of being able to go and I think about who is when I listen to the voices of people who are the ones that are who are actually with the program in the sense they understand the seriousness and they want to actually make whatever changes that are needed, however big those changes are, I would say that appetite is coming from young people. So one of the things is we need to create more spaces for young people's ideas and looking at the world through fresh lenses. And let's be clear, young people are going to be the ones who are going to pay the price for the absence of leadership now. Mm. Secondly, we have to talk about climate and finance two of the biggest issues that impact. See, two of the biggest issues that impact on humanity is the climate challenge and the fact that we've got a broken financial system that benefits a handful of people and leaves most people marginalized. But both of them have something in common, that the way people talk about finance and climate is designed almost to shut 99% of people out of the conversation because once you start talking degrees and temperatures and acronyms and so on, it's very difficult for ordinary people to be part of the conversation. So one of the things we need to do to build that kind of movement, including from the progressives who are in that movement, because they are also afflicted by the same 
disease of jargon and, 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 and language that ordinary people cannot engage with. So one of the things is we have to start being able to communicate in accessible ways that opens the door to more and more people being able to participate. So, th so that's the other thing. That, and I have to say, finally, how do we make this movement move forward? If history teaches us anything, whenever humanity has been faced by a terrible injustice or a terrible challenge, whether it was slavery, colonialism, or women's right to vote, civil rights in the United States, apartheid in South Africa, those struggles only moved forward when decent women and men stood up and said, enough is enough and no more. We're prepared to go to prison if necessary. We're prepared to put our lives on the line if necessary. We're prepared to engage in peaceful civil disobedience. And I want to say that the challenge of climate change in some ways is more bigger than all the other historical challenges combined because this year is about whether humanity will survive and whether our children will be able 200 years from now be able to prosper and live a decent life. You, you, you just referenced the necessity of people being willing to risk it all, including their lives. Um, you have had that experience in the anti-apartheid movement, but I, I reference that because you have also said to some uh, interviewers in the past that you felt you were living on borrowed time. What did you mean by that? Do you still feel that way? Well, for me, this is a deeply ethical issue, right? in the sense that I was a young leader in the anti-apartheid struggle. I became a leader at the age of 15 uh, when there was a national student uprising and I was one of the leaders thrown up by that campaign. And true, at 15 you don't know too much, uh, but you have eyes to see and you can see what the government was spending on a white kid, what the government was spending on a black kid, right? You know, in schools, just when you drove, when you went by bus from your township to the center of town, you passed white schools along the way and you could just see, my God, they've got a playing field that is five times bigger than my entire school, right? You know, for example. One of the things that was clear, the only way we could actually aggregate power was by mobilizing large numbers of people to have the courage to stand up. Now, as Mandela said, courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is the ability of humanity to triumph over it, right? And so, for me, I was always, you know, if I was involved in something risky, my, my heart was coming right out here sometimes, you know, as a 15, 16 year old. In the course I recruited, I played a role in recruiting many, many young people, my age, friends, colleagues, people in, who got involved in the struggle. And sadly, some of them did not survive the struggle, including my best friend, uh, whose name was Lenny Naidu. And Lenny was brutally murdered by the apartheid regime. There were so many bullets in his body, uh, his parents couldn't even recognize him at the, mort uh, you know, at the mortuary. What, was he in a, a demonstration at the time? Where he, he, was he had fled with me into exile in ah. 1986. And when he was coming back into the country, he and three young women from my home city were brutally murdered. Uh, were ambushed and brutally murdered by the apartheid regime. And, um, and, and so, you know, it could have easily been me rather than Lenny, right? Yeah. And during that time growing up, you know, <laughs> words like the future, career path, pension, all of these words had absolutely no meaning to us because we lived under that repressive regime. You thought you were not going to live yeah, to get a pension. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it was quite a traumatic thing finding yourself in your late 20s and Mandela was out and we were preparing for the first democratic election and you were still alive, you know, it, it was, so, so what, uh, and for me, the ethical question here is what is the responsibility of a leader who mobilizes people to get involved, who, who then sometimes go and pay a higher price, like my friend paid a higher price than me because he died at the age of 24, right? What is my obligation for the rest of my life? How do I honor his memory, the three women he was killed with, and many, many others who I loved, respected, and so on, who perished in the struggle? So for me, when I say living on borrowed time, I could have easily, it was an absolute uh, luck of the draw, 
that I was not the person who got killed and my friend Lenny or others got killed. And I feel a terrible sense of betrayal that I see now by the new leadership in our country that have become extremely corrupt, who seem to have completely forgotten the sacrifices that so many people made, so much of blood was spilt and so on. And my friend Lenny, in the last conversation I had with him before we fled into exile in different directions at the age of 22, he asked me a question where he said, Kumi, what is the biggest contribution we can make to the cause of justice? And I said, that's an easy question, giving your life. And at that time, you know, every other weekend we were at funerals, bedding uh, friends and comrades that had been killed in the struggle. And he said to me, Kumi, it's a wrong answer. It's not giving your life, but giving the rest of your life. Now, my friend Lenny was way ahead of us. He was the first environmentalist I knew. He was, I jokingly say, at that time, I think he was one of only 5,000 voluntary vegetarians on the entire African continent. <laughs> uh, you know, so we hugged each other, shed some tears because we never knew when we'll see each other and we went in different directions. And so when I got the news while I was a student at Oxford that he had been murdered, uh, I had to think deep and hard about that last conversation. And what he was saying is a struggle for economic justice, social justice, gender justice, climate justice, indigenous people's rights justice, whatever issue, those struggles are marathons and they're not sprints. And the biggest contribution that any one of us can make is be true to that cause and continue to push to have the perseverance until those injustices have been eradicated. So when I look at some of our political leaders around the world and, and in my context as well in Africa, I believe that the liberation movements which brought out the best in us in terms of sacrificing for the people and so on. But once in power, far too many of our leaders got as intoxicated with power and put their own personal interests ahead of the people as a whole. You opted not to get involved in government. You, you deliberately stayed out, even though you could have as an activist, as someone who was on the front lines, um, been part of an administration or a department? Well, I have a very precious letter from Walter Sisulu, who spent uh, 27 years on Robben Island. He actually recruited Mandela. Oh, you know, Sisulu recruited, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. And uh, in, you know, when Mandela moved from Transkei to Johannesburg. And, um, and the letter was offering me to come and head the ANC's media division in the run-up to the first democratic election. At the same time, I got approached by a woman who I love and respect and who's been a mentor called Mary Makonazi, who, who is from Durban, where I'm from. And she was one of the founders of the South African Domestic Workers Union, the most exploited workers in South Africa together with farm workers. And I went to see her, so I said, Aunt Mary, you know, Baba Sisulu has asked me to do this. And at the same time, I've also been asked to head up the adult literacy movement, which is a non-profit alliance to promote adult education, because bear in mind that the most chilling statement about apartheid policy was about education. The founder of apartheid, Hendrik Verfoot, said, and I quote, blacks should never be shown the greener pastures of education. They should know that their station in life is to be ewers of wood and drawers of water, choppers of wood and carriers of water. Uh, and so when democracy came, the majority of the people were not even able to read the ballot, right? And as Archbishop Desmond Tutu says, the education system under apartheid was a heavy punch to the solar plexus of the majority of our people, right? And so um, Aunt Mary said to me, my boy, whether the ANC has a media division or don't have a media division, they're going to win the election. <laughs> If you went into this job and you tried to do the job badly, the ANC will still win the election. So if you want to be famous, be on TV and so on, go do the ANC job. And bear in mind, if you say no to the ANC job, there'll be about a thousand other people who want to take it. But who's going to go run this adult literacy mm -hmm. campaign where there's no money, no prestige and so on? And she said, you really want to make a difference? Go run the adult literacy campaign. And we need, she said, some good people to stay out of government so that we can hold 
our new leaders accountable because we should not take it for granted mm. that they're going to be saints. I want to spend a little bit of time, if you agree, to talk about your personal life and specifically your mom. Uh, two questions. How did your family react to your decision to be an activist at such a young age? Uh, I, I, I can imagine that they may have had other dreams for you, like, I don't know, mm. educated doctor, whatever. And then, um, what was the impact of your mom's suicide on, on your life decisions? I would say uh, massive and transformational, right? Uh, it's hard to quantify it with specificity, you know, but suffice to say that um, she committed suicide sort of two weeks before the first national student uprising that I would take part in occurred. Oh, it was before? It was before, yeah. Oh. Uh, but I had already become politicized, and I can tell you she was anxious, as was all, all my parents. Yeah. Because basically, parents knew. If you get involved in the struggle, it meant you're either going to be killed or you're going to end up in prison. And one of the things our parents used to always tell us, if we asked them, why can't we swim at that beach? They would say, don't ask questions like that. You'll end up with Nelson Mandela on Robben Island. <laughs> now, Robben Island was the prison where he was held. Now, as a young kid, primary school, I already knew there was a place called Robben Island. And once you got into that prison, you, didn't you get could out. never get out. Right? And so, but my mom... Uh, you know, even though she was 38 when she died and I was 15 when she died, I think most of what I do is very informed by the values she, she shared with us, even though it was not framed in a political sense. So, for example, she would always say things like, it's much better to try and fail than fail to try. And that's the that's life of an activist. 90% yeah. of the time, you're going to be knocked down, you're going to get beaten up, you're going to get thrown into jail, you're going to lose that fight. But the ability to continue to try is what makes a good activist with a sense of stamina, perseverance, and courage. The second thing, which for me is really important, because I engage with people who are very different from my values and so on, and I can do so with respect, right? Uh, I mean, uh, and I think it's important right now that in a world that is dividing along so many fault lines, that leadership is not about accentuating those divisions, but about creating the possibility of dialogue that leads people to greater understanding and hopefully some measure of compromise. But what we don't even have in the world today is the ability to actually talk you know, across different perspectives. And so my mom used to say, uh, you know, always see God in the eyes of every human being that you meet, right? She said, there are many people who profess some this religion, that religion, and so on. But if you cannot actually see God in the embodiment of every human being that you meet, and then you still go to the church, temple, synagogue, and spend hours and hours praying. But if you're disrespecting what you call the manifestations of God, which is people, then there's no point you're going, you know. And the third thing she said, always try to see the best in other people and focus on the weaknesses in yourself because you can do something about the weaknesses in yourself. You can't do too much about the weaknesses in others. And those three very simple things have really informed the way I engage with people. And you know, when I was at uh, Greenpeace, people used to get shocked because I would have a very difficult conversation with the CEO of the most powerful companies in the, in, in the world. But when our activists were pr in prison in Russia, spending three months, I could pick up a phone, call a CEO of some of the top 100 companies in the world and say, I understand you're going to Russia to talk business with the Russian leadership. I need you to actually raise the issue about putting pressure on them to get our people out. And they would go, they would have the conversation, they will call me, give me the analysis, say how far they got and so on. And people would say, my God, how did you manage to do that? I said, well, 
When I'm speaking to the CEO of a company who's engaged in economic activity that's driving us to climate destruction, I don't just see him as an enemy, I also see him as a victim. He's a victim of an economic orthodoxy that he or she, mostly it's he, was told that's how economics works. And he's stuck there. You know, in, in yes, of okay, case, he's stuck, but he's got big bucks and he's, you know, <laughs> is, is uh, benefiting from the current system, perhaps. But that doesn't mean he's not a victim. Just as in the South African context, you know, when Nelson Mandela from prison taught us that whites were never our enemy, that white people are as oppressed as well, hmm. that white people are ideologically oppressed, they've been sold a lie that white supremacy is something that's real and so on. And so the need to see the humanity in the people that you have a difference with, I think is a critically needed um, commodity today. And so privilege, economic material privilege, definitely does not guarantee you happiness and sometimes can be actually the source of your discomfort with what's happening around you. Thank you for your insight, Kumi Naidu. Thank you very much for having me. For more on this program and other Carnegie Ethics Studio productions, visit carnegiecouncil.org. There you can find video highlights, transcripts, audio recordings, and other multimedia resources on global ethics. This program is made possible by the Carnegie Ethics Studio and viewers like you.